It is highly recommended that you read our notes on equity and trust three sessions after this session, which can be found on this link. Three certainties are the following. A clear intention to create a trust as opposed to creating something else. In other words, it's called a certainty of intention. Therefore, it must be certain on the wording of the trust that the set law of the trust intended to create a trust rather than something else. Something else could be a mere power or, or a, a fiduciary power. The trust property must be sufficiently segregated from other property. Certainty of subject matter. And finally, the people who are to benefit from the trust must also be identified with sufficient certainty. It's called certainty of objects. Without the three certainties being satisfied, any trust will fail, any trust will be void. And in an exam question, most likely you will have different scenarios, you will have different wordings of the, of the trust and the question, the problem question will ask you if what has been given to you can be upheld as a valid trust. And then you need to apply to the facts of the case, the laws on three certainties. If three certainties are present, and if you can demonstrate based on the relevant cases and principles that certainty of intention, certainty of subject matter, and certainty of objects is satisfied, then you can conclude in your answer that the given scenario is definitely a trust. Exceptions exist to the three certainties rules. General rule is that if the three certainties are not present, then there is no trust. However, there are exceptions like charitable trusts. In case of charitable trusts, the third certainty of object does not need to exist. And third, also there are exceptional purpose trusts that have been held valid such as trusts for taking care of animals, maintenance of graves and monuments and religious services. These trusts have been upheld in different cases to be valid despite of absence of certainty of objects because uh, these are related to concessions to human sentiment and judges have allowed them because they saw no harm in them. Now we are going to take into consideration the relevant laws and cases and principles under each certainties. We're starting with certainty of intention. In order to determine whether there is certainty of intention of the given facts, it is very important that you cite the relevant cases. You have to compare the facts that have been given to you in the problem question to the cases and then argue whether or not there is certainty of intention. For example, the case of Lund versus Eames can be, is often cited for certainty of intention. The statement to be at her disposal in any way she may think best for the benefit of herself and her family was held to be merely a moral obligation. And the approach taken by the court in this case was that to impose a trust the statement has to be read as a whole rather than any particular word. This is a very important judgment. And the main takeaway from this judgment is that you should analyze the whole statement that has been given to you in the problem question as a whole rather than each individual word. You're not required to analyze each individual word. And even, even in, the, in the wording, it says the trust, it doesn't actually mean that there is a trust you should take into consideration the whole sentence rather than each word. Identify a case where similar facts apply to your problem question and conclude if there is likelihood of certainty of intention to be validly set out. Even if you have various cases that may suggest different outcome, for example, you have one case that according to which it can be argued that there is certainty of intention, whereas there is another case according to which it can be argued that there is no certainty of intention. 
you should cite both cases. You should apply both cases and say which one you think is more applicable and say that if the court takes this view, this um, case should be applied, therefore there is certainty of detention or otherwise. Also, there is an important case I would like you to know about, Tito versus Waddell. The use of the word trust in an in instrument or in a statute will not necessarily mean that a court will deem that to be a trust. Therefore, in your problem question, if you see a word trust in, in the wording, do not automatically assume that this is a trust. You need to, as we said before, identify the relevant case, apply to the facts of the case, and analyze the whole sentence rather than any particular word. It is important that you know relevant cases to distinguish moral obligations from trusts. Merely imposing a moral obligation on a person who is the recipient of property will not create a trust. The expression generally used by the courts to distinguish between a declaration of a trust um, and a moral obligation is to define merely moral obligations as setting out precatory words. The example of a moral obligation is when a parent gives a child money to buy a book as a reward and says, don't spend it all on sweets, that does not make the child a trustee of the money. The child is not obliged to spend the money as the parent, the set law said. This is just a moral obligation. The parent is just telling the child how she, how she should be spending the money. There is no trust in this case. Certainty of subject matter. It's the second certainty out of the three that needs to be satisfied in order for the trust to be held valid. Property, which is intended to constitute the trust fund is segregated from all the property so that its identity is sufficiently certain. If there is no certainty of subject matter, the trust will be void as the court will not be able to recognize, control or administer the trust property. Therefore, the subject matter of the trust has to be validly identified. However, there are exceptions to this rule and we will see what can be the exception. For example, if, uh, if the test strip says, I leave my property to be held in trust for my husband, what is property exactly? If this person only has one property under his name, then there, it can be assumed that there is certainty of subject matter. However, if this person owns multiple properties, which property did he mean ex exactly? If it's not possible to identify which property um, the test strips mean in particular, then the trust will fail. Traditional approach to this uh, issue is that the trust property must be segregated from any other property and identified or identifiable. The case that represents the traditional approach is boys versus boys. You should always cite a relevant case for every principle that you're putting in, in the answer of your problem question always make sure that you cite a relevant case. If you're citing a traditional approach to certainty of subject matter, make sure that you put the case of boys versus boys. In this case, a father divided in his will, his properties to be conveyed and trust to his two daughters. He wrote that Maria, his daughter, had to choose whichever of the two of his four cottages she wanted and the leftover would be conveyed to Charlotte, his second daughter. However, Maria died without making a selection. Was there a valid trust? The, the trust obviously failed for uncertainty because the, tr the property itself was not identified. It was not clearly identified which property did he mean. It is very important that in a problem question, you take into consideration if the subject matter of the trust is tangible or intangible. If it's a tangible property, the case that you need to site is Red London Wine Co. In this case, the subject matter of the trust was wine, and it was not clearly identified which exactly which bottles of wine that was the subject of the trust. Therefore, the trust failed. The, uh, the principle for intangible property 
is set out in the case of Hunter versus Moss. Here, the employee could assert that he had proprietary rights on 50 shares out of 950. According to the orthodox approach, the exact 50 shares were not identified. So there should not have been certainty of subject matter. Here we're talking about shares of a company. In this case, the shares uh, that were subject to this trust were absolutely identical. There can be different kinds of shares in a company that have different rights. There can be ordinary shares, there, there can be preferred shares. However, in this case, the shares were identical. They have all the same rights and there was absolutely no difference between one share to another. Therefore, Dillon LJ took a different approach than the traditional approach. I always held that a valid trust exists in this case because there were two underlying motivations for this decision. One was that the finding of a trust would enforce the terms of the employment contract between the parties. And the second was that it made no practical difference in which 50 shares were subject to the trust given. Therefore, not only that it was an intangible property, but also because it, there was no difference between one share to another. Most probably, if there was difference between one share to another, the approach that the judge would have taken would be different. Therefore, it's not just that it's an intangible property and Hunter versus Moss principle automatically applies. Take into consideration the facts of the case. If in a problem question that has been given to you, there are the, the, the subject matter of the trust is intangible property. However, the subject matter is different from one another, different approach may be taken. You may say that Hunter versus Moss can be distinguished on the facts because in Hunter versus Moss, subject matter of the trust was identical. There was no difference between one share to another. Third, certainty of objects. Here, what you need to take into consideration is beneficiary principle, which means that for the trust to be held valid, there must be a beneficiary. Morris versus Bishop can be the case to cite on this principle. Here, uh, for a non-charitable trust to be given a fact of law, the beneficiaries of the trust must be identifiable. A trust will be void if the objects of the trust are uncertain. Court courts cannot know whether or not trustees have exercised their powers properly if there is uncertainty as to the people who stood to benefit from that trust. As we said before, there are exceptions to these rules, such as charitable trusts. Notes on charitable trusts can be accessed on our website. The distinction between trust and power. It is important that you know what is the difference. An ordinary power, which is not in the form of a trust obligation, creates no such proprietary rights for any beneficiary, but may impose fiduciary obligations on the holder of the power. Such powers are referred to as mere powers because they do not raise the level of creating trusts. A good example is the following sentence. Jack may advance £1,000 to Sarah. As against to Jack shall pay £1,000 to Sarah. As you can see, the first one is just a mere power, whereas the other one imposes a legal obligation of a trust by saying shall as against to may. There are also different kinds of trusts that you need to be aware of. Firstly, fixed trusts. The beneficiary's interests are specified and fixed. The trustee of a fixed trust has little or no power at all to distribute the trust property or change the beneficiary to their discretion. Beneficiaries receive the trust property on a specific schedule as set by the set law. The example of a fixed trust is the following. Mike and Molly shall receive equal amounts of £25,000 in capital per annum. As you can see, the trustee of this trust has almost no power in distributing the trust property. There is the, the certainty of subject matter is £25,000. This is the trust property. And the trustee has to give Mike and Molly equal amounts distributed equally. There is no power, there is no discretion for the trustee. 
On the contrary, we have discretionary trusts. Here, the beneficial interests are left to the discretion of the trustees, who possess the power to appoint the beneficiaries of the trust. Further, the amount of the beneficiaries may receive is left to the discretion of the trustees when considering the beneficiary's circumstances. The very uh, tricky part of the problem question is sometimes to distinguish what is discretionary trust and mere power. The wording of the trust for discretionary power, uh, discretionary trust and mere power can be quite similar. So the only way for you to be able to deal with this kind of legal issue in a problem question is to identify the case, the relevant case that is similar to the facts that has been presented to you in a problem question and apply its reasoning. One case may suggest that it's a discretionary trust. The other case may suggest that it's a mere power. Your job here would be to identify which case would be more applicable, but mention both and say what is more likely outcome that may, may the court take in this case. The example of discretionary trust, James and Jessica shall receive equal amounts of 25,000 pounds. This annual sum may be subject to change depending upon the financial circumstances of the stated beneficiaries at the discretion of the trustee. As you can see, Martin, the trustee here has discretion as to distributing the trust property. Yes, it should be distributed in equal amounts. However, he has to take into consideration the financial circumstances of the beneficiaries and to decide if this is a good distribution of the money or change it as he considers right. Therefore, he has a power to amend the trust and distribute the trust property as he considers right. The test for certainty of objects in relation to fixed trusts. It is necessary for the trustee to be able to compile a complete list of beneficiaries. You need to take into consideration that the test for certainty of objects can be different from one kind of trust to another. For fixed trusts, it's a complete list of beneficiaries. The case to cite for this test is um, Broadway Cottages and um, Red Gill Banking. The test for certainty of objects in relation to fiduciary powers is set out in the case of Red Gilpenkin. The test of certainty of objects in relation to fiduciary powers is also known as is or is not test. This basically means that if one person comes into a room, the trustee should be able to identify if this person is or is not in the list of beneficiaries. The leading case in relation to certainty of objects under a discretionary trust power is Macfield's, is Dalton. Their lordships, in, partic in particular the leading judgment of Lord Wilberforce, adopted the regal banking test, which is is or is not test for discretionary trust. Whether it could be said with certainty that any given individual is or is not a member of the class. Now I would like to give you a recommended reading list for this study module. It is very important that you read our notes that can be accessed via this link. We also have example essays that show you very clearly what is expected from you in a problem and essay question. We have plenty of example essays for equity law and it is highly recommended that you have a look. We also have very simple case summaries that emphasize the facts and principles that are the most important for you to know for exam purposes. We also have quizzes and flashcards that are very ideal for revision and especially for students who have exams as examination requires you to memorize the cases and principles rather than coursework may not, may not request the same thing. Now I would like to give you a little bit of more information about how simple studying can help you in preparing for your exams and coursework. We are a team of students and graduates who have all achieved very high grades in our respective law degrees. We have created simple studying to help the rest of the law students have the same success as we had. We have simple notes, sample essays, tutorial videos, quizzes, flashcards, study and exam tips, all tailored to, for law students to 
achieve highest grades as quickly and as easily as possible. If the resources are not enough, we have an additional service that is tutoring services. And tutoring services is a one-to-one -one meeting where we help students, we give them personalized help to help them achieve their objective, if whether it's to prepare for an exam effectively or to plan their assignment or anything that a student may be struggling with in their legal studies. We have already helped thousands of law students achieve high grades, as you can see on the reviews. We would love you to be the, our next student to, help, to get high grades. Please join Simple Study now. And you're also, it is also recommended that you join our WhatsApp groups to interact with our community. Thank you very much for your time.